All right, thanks. Uh, uh, some people came and asked me about the source code for my previous talk. It's in GitHub. You can get the address there. No licensing, do whatever you want with it. And if you didn't get the URL now, then you can ask me afterwards. Okay, so I'm just gonna continue right where Peter stopped. So we're gonna continue on this uh, talking about background threads, asynchronous communications, and, and Vardin, and how to do it, and what not to do. And I have uh, lots of examples of stuff that doesn't work. And then I also, of course, have some examples of stuff that works. So hopefully, uh, this probably is going to be my shortest talk some, so far. So, uh, quick poll: How many of you have actually used background threads in your Viden applications? So uh, maybe a third or so. Okay. So. Why would you want to use background threads? Uh, Peter already showed us an, an excellent application and an excellent example of why we want to do it. So uh, long running jobs to prevent the application from freezing. So we want to get a good user experience. So that's the, the case that Peter showed us. Uh, then we have another case, uh, backend polling. Uh, let's say you have a, a backend that doesn't have some kind of callback feature. Uh, for example, the activity process engine. Has anybody used the activity process engine in their Varian applications? No? Well, anyway, it has a very clear API, but it doesn't have any event notifications when something happens. So you actually have to have a thread that sort of continuously polls where there's, there's been uh, new tasks assigned to a certain user, So, for example. So uh, that's a, a perfect use case where you might want to use a backend thread. Uh, then scheduling jobs, uh, you might have uh, different tasks that you need to run, like once a minute, once an hour, once a day. There might be different types of cleanup jobs. Uh, for example, if you're sort of reserving tickets for, let's say, 20 minutes, then you will want to have a thread that cleans up tickets that weren't purchased and so on. Or then if you're doing reactive programming, so asynchronous message-based programming, so instead of, of doing this uh, typical synchronous programming model where you just uh, do something and then you wait and then you get the result, you're sort of sending messages away and waiting for something to happen, and then it comes back, and then you might have a callback, and so on. So that's uh, reasons why you want to use background threads. And uh, the way how server push works in Vardin, really quickly. Um, first, to be able to actually enable server push, and there are a few things you need to do. So you need to start by adding this Vardin push jar to your class path. So without this jar, there will be no pushing. And the second thing you need to do is to add this at push annotation to your UI. And once you've done this, you have push and push enable Vardin application. And there are two modes that you, that you can use for pushing uh, automatic, which is the default one, and then manual, which means that you actually have to invoke a push method to perform this push from the server to the user client. There are also three transport modes, actually four, but one of them is deprecated. So three transport modes as of the latest Vardin version. Uh, the default mode is WebSockets. So this basically means that if you have Vardin push jar and you have a push annotation, by default, Vardin will def uh, use WebSockets uh, for both pushing and all the other communication as well. So only the first request will be HTTP, then it will change it to a WebSocket connection and use WebSockets for everything else. This has some uh, interesting side effects when you're using other web-based frameworks. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Uh, if WebSockets uh, isn't available, for example, uh, your browser doesn't support it, the web server, there's some load balancer or something that doesn't support it, you can go for long polling, which is uh, basic HTTP with long requests. And then uh, there is this new one, which was added in Vardin 7.6, uh, WebSockets plus XHR. So this basically means that uh, you will use basic HTTP for everything except the pull requests, which will go over WebSockets. And this is an approach that makes your life a lot easier if you're using Spring Security, for example. Uh, the thread safety in a Vardin application. 
Uh, rule of thumb, always lock the VOD in session before you touch it from within another thread. So uh, this includes updating or accessing a VOD in UI, because uh, a VOD in session can contain many UIs, and uh, they all touch the session, so you really want to lock the session before you do something. Uh, you can do this either manually, there are lock and unlock methods on the VOD in session object, or you can let Vardin handle the locking for you, and this is normally the recommended way of doing it, because then you don't need to worry about it at all. And uh, if you want to do this automatically, there is this uh, one method called access. You can find it both on the UI class, you can find it in the Vardin session class. And this access method takes a single parameter, it's called, uh, which is a uh, Java runnable, so if you're using Java 8, you can pass in any, a method pointer to just any void method uh, that doesn't take any parameters. And uh, this will basically, if you invoke this method, it will, uh, on the next uh, opportunity it gets to run it, it will lock the session, perform your runnable, then it will unlock the session and send a push notification to the client. So if you're just using this access method, you will get both session locking and a push for free. There is also, uh, this is a, an asynchronous method, so once you call this uh, access, it will return immediately and, and, and run this runnable somewhere else. Yep. Mm, no, if it's, uh, I'm actually not sure if it's, I think you have to actually invoke this push method if it's set to manual, yeah. Um, I actually never had to use manual, so uh, to be completely honest, I don't know, but that's a good question anyway. All right, uh, one thing uh, that it's pretty easy, uh, a problem that you can run into is uh, you push too often. Uh, let's say you have some kind of, of event processing system that processes like hundreds of events per second and you want this to update your UI, it's really easy to implement a piece of code that every time an event arrives, you will create a new access call, update the UI. That would basically mean that you're updating your UI 100 times a second, and it's going to clog down your system a lot. So uh, in this case, you will probably need to redesign your UI in some way. So you need to figure out, OK, how, how often does it actually make sense to update the UI? I mean, if you're doing a swing app, then this might work because it's running locally. But if you're using a Vardin app, every update means some traffic over HTTP. So it's going to take time. The updates aren't free. So uh, if you think about how a user reacts, then maybe like uh, two to three times a second is more than enough to give the impression of instant feedback when you're using a web app application. And in that case, you probably need to sort of store the incoming events if you're getting lots and lots of events uh, per second and store them and then cache them in sort of bursts as a, as a kind of batch mode so that you, the UI still is updated, the user thinks it's coming in in real time, but still you're trying to keep, keep the number of pushes low. Uh, if uh, this isn't a problem, you know that the events won't be coming this frequently, then you can just forget about it. But uh, um, keep in mind, whenever you have lots of events coming in, uh, think about how often you push. Right, um, that's basically the theory. Now we're going to move on to an example application and then start to look at how you can do this uh, in different ways and uh, why they are bad and what we can do to fix them. So uh, this example application that I've written, it's, uh, it's really stupid, again. So it's, it's got a backend that needs to get, be pulled for changes. So uh, when a change occurs, we want the user to be notified. And in this case, uh, we're polling once a second. We don't need him to do this more often. And the first iteration that I'm going to show you so this is a, a very, very naive implement, implementation. So every UI will fire up its own thread. And the thread will run in a loop that pulls the back end and then sleeps for 1,000 milliseconds. So let's uh, run this up, fire this up. Thread sample. 
I'm gonna show you, start by showing the application, how it behaves. By the way, I think I'm going to need to disable my Wi-Fi because for some reason some of my Java tools stop working in this house. Yeah, for example. This is the running application. Should be getting messages pretty soon. Yeah, there's one. So it's just uh, it's not doing anything else than pulling a dummy backend that generates messages. And then here it's actually writing a log a log line every time it pulls. So as you can see, it's pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And the code. This is as again. This is the naive implementation. So I have an eternal loop here starting a new thread in the init and then I'm just pulling and then I'm invoking this, this access method here to add a new label to the UI. So that's uh, this example. Now, uh, what's wrong with this? And yeah, what do you say? The polling itself, well, yeah, uh, the polling itself is of course uh, something that should be avoided. But in this case, it's some idiot who wrote this backend, and it's, un uh, uh, it's not under our control, so we just have to live with it. But still, um, uh, that's not the way we want to do it. So uh, they got one thing right, though. So the UI is using the access method. So that's right. That's how we should do it. So we will get the session locking, and we're getting the push. That's great. Uh, but the problems with this approach, First of all, the thread contains an internal loop, so it will never stop. So for example, now if I, I close this browser window and exit this uh, presentation mode so we can get the, the, the output here, it's still polling. And uh, this is going to continue for each UI, we're going to get a new thread that polls until the end of times. Also, it contained a call to thread.sleep, and that's really, really, really ugly. It works, but it's ugly. There are better ways. Also, we don't have any error handling. So uh, if there were uh, an error happening now in the backend, that thread would just die, and there would not be any, any information. The user wouldn't get any notification that the thread has stopped running. He would just think that, OK, there are no more messages. And also, uh, we created a new thread instance for every new UI instance. And uh, this is not a good idea, because uh, threads are a limited resource. Now, just how limited, I'm going to show you. I have a pro program here that call, I'm calling a thread bomb. It's basically a thread that starts up a new thread that starts up a new thread that starts up a new thread. So now I'm going to run it. So uh, after 2023 threads, we run out of memory. Uh, if you have a powerful server, you're probably going to serve more than 2023 UI instances. So uh, if you create new thread instances, like I did here, in your UIs, uh, and if you have uh, lots of users, then chances are at some point you're going to run out of threads. This is actually surprisingly small. 2023, if you consider that this is a pretty powerful laptop. Now, obviously, you can tweak the virtual machine to get the number up, but still, creating new threads is not a good idea. So, let's do um, another. Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, I can do some some more background detail before moving on to the next iteration. Um, this thread example here that I just showed, uh, this is typical for somebody who's coming from a Swing background. Because in a Swing application, it's a single user application running on a local machine, so you have access to all the resources yourself. It's, uh, it's a no big deal to fire up lots of threads in a Swing app, because you will most likely not run out of them. And the Vardin application, uh, this programming model, it's pretty similar to Swing, so it's very easy to think in terms of a single user swing when you're mo developing a in UI. And uh, that's a, a common mistake. So that's a... Uh, are there any swing people here, by the way? A few of you. Okay. 
But anyway, don't do that. So um, our developer is moving on. He learned that you should never start a new thread. So now he is. Uh, he heard about timers. Timers looks good, right? So uh, I'm gonna create a new one. Uh, refactor my UI. I create a new timer for every UI, and uh, then I'm gonna pull the back end every 1,000 milliseconds. And when the UI is detached, the timer is stopped. So um, I've got my timer sample here. Implementation looks uh, slightly different. So. I'm going to enter my, or actually it's probably easier if I just zoom in, yeah. So, init method, I'm creating a new timer, scheduling a new task, every thousand milliseconds, and then in the detach method, I'm canceling the timer. So this looks good, right? And I'm still using access. So let's fire this one up. Now we got it running, should be receiving a message there, it's the first one already. Looks good. Still running. Okay. What's wrong with this approach? Again, uh, there were some things uh, doing right. We're no longer using thread sleep, so we got rid of that one. And we also have this call to, to stop this uh, timer when the UI is detached. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this didn't actually solve our original problem with threads, because internally a timer will also start up its new thread. So we're still getting uh, a one thread per UI. And if you don't believe me, I have a timer bomb. You're all familiar with the fork bomb, I assume. No? It's a really easy way to bring down a Unix system, but we're going to leave that for a second another time. <laughs> I'm not going to show it, right? <laughs> yeah, this is a timer that starts a timer that starts a timer that starts a timer. So we're getting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of exceptions again because we're running out of, of threads. So it, this didn't help didn't solve our original problem. All right. Third iteration. Let's try to use a thread pool instead. So uh, when the application starts up, we're going to create a new thread pool. And uh, each UI is going to schedule a job with this thread pool. And this job is then going to pull the backend, and when the UI is detached, it's going to cancel the job. So it's almost the same as the timer, but instead of using a timer, we're using a thread pool. And uh, the code looks like this. So first of all, I have a... Let me zoom in so you can see. Uh, I have a Serlet context listener. This basically is an object that gets initialized when our web application starts, and then it gets destroyed when it's undeployed. And uh, here I'm creating a new executor service. Uh, I'm using 10 threads in the pool. In a real application, you probably want to use more. Or probably in a real application, you want to make it configurable so you can tune it depending on the needs. And then over here, we're scheduling a new job when the UI is initialized, and then I'm canceling it in the detached method. So let's fire this one up. See if it works. be getting a message pretty soon. Yep, there it is. And now we're getting pretty close to, to the way we want this to work. Uh, but actually, uh, there are still some problems with this. 
and um, I'm gonna show you first thing I'm gonna show you so you can see it's pulling it's still pulling closing the browser window still pulling why? Um, no, not a separate instance. Um, this has to do with how Wadin works. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, we're waiting for the heartbeat. That's right. So uh, the way Wadin works is um, uh, in order for the Wadin servlet to know that a UI instance is still alive, basically that the browser is still open, is that there's a heartbeat signal that's being sent between the server and the client. And by default, this heartbeat signal is sent every five minutes if you don't change it. And it will require three missed heartbeats for the browser, for the server to, to decide that, okay, this UI is no more, we're gonna detach it. So basically, um, in this case, uh, we would, if we were using the default configuration, we would have to wait 15 minutes until we detach and stop the thread. So for 15 minutes, our thread is going to run pulling the backend without us even needing it. In this application, I've configured the timeout to be five seconds. So basically, it should have stopped after five seconds, but still it doesn't. It's still pulling. I've been talking for longer than 15 seconds now. The reason for this is that there actually is no background job in Vardin that cleans out sessions. So this is actually every time a request is processed, it will see if there are any UIs that have been detached. So, if I now access this example, I'll just remember what the URL was. It was thread. Oh, I'm getting it from the history. There it is. All right, so now something should have happened. Yeah, here we got it. Now it was detached. Now the job stopped, and we got another polling job for another UI. So this is something that you really need to sort of... Uh, this could have some pretty serious performance consequences when you're designing your Wadin application. So how long will your background jobs be running? And even if you're stopping them when you detach the browser, um, they will, might still continue to run for some time. Um, there's a, another problem with our approach that we're doing now as well, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to fire up uh, Visual VM. Hopefully it works this time. And uh, by the way, this was the tool that stopped working when I had VLAN enabled in this room. I have no idea why. How many of you have used the Visual VM? All right, so uh, about a quarter, a third of you. So this is uh, nowadays. This is a tool that's bundled uh, with standard JDK, so you don't need to download it separately. So you should already have it if you're using a sufficiently modern version of Java. And uh, it's a, a, a profiling tool that allows you to attach to any running Java process and have a look under the hood what's happening. So here you can see how is your application uh, using the CPU, how many classes are loaded, how many threads are you running. How much memory are you using? This is an excellent tool when it comes to tracking down memory leaks and thread leaks. And you can even have a look at, at if you turn on sampling or profile, you can actually look at, at, at the individual structures, like how many instances are there of a specific class, and make sure that, that you clean up all the resources, uh, for example, when a UI is expired. But the thing I want to look at now is these threads. So here we can see. These are all the threads uh, that are currently running inside my Tomcat instance. Here you can see, here are the pool threads. So pool one, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got ten threads here running in our thread pool, right? Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to undeploy this application. So now I'm undeploying it. 
so it's no longer running on the server. But the threads are. The application is uninstalled, it's not running, but the threads are still alive and well. Now I'm going to redeploy this application. Waiting for it to start up. Application is running. Pool 2. We got 10 more threads. The pool 1 threads are still live and running. They are still pulling the backend. Even though we've deployed our application again and the, a new application is running with a new set of threads. So, why is this? Anyone? The problem that, that with threads is uh, that once we start them, if we forget to shut them down, they will continue until you kill the VM, regardless of if you redeploy or, or do whatever you want to your application. So if you have this kind of system, and let's say you redeploy this application enough times without restarting the web uh, servlet container, you're going to run out of threads. And each thread also consumes memory, so you're going to uh, run out of memory as well. This uh, is a problem uh, when using certain third-party libraries. For example, uh, there, are, uh, there are basically two schools nowadays when it comes to developing uh, web servers. We got the Java EE guys who redeploy the WAR files without restarting the servers. And then we got the Spring Boot guys who sort of bundle everything into a one self-contained jar, so every time you deploy a new version, you essentially restart the server. If you restart the server, this isn't a problem, because then it will kill all the threads, you will get a fresh set of threads. The problem is, if you take a library that's been developed by these uh, uh, standalone guys, and deploy it into a war application, for example, uh, Hystrix, anybody heard about that? Archaeus, anybody heard about that? These are both two pretty popular libraries from Netflix. They are open sourced. Hystrix is a circuit breaker, and Archaeus is a way of uh, doing distributed configuration. They both fire up a lot of background, or not a lot, but they fire up their own background threads. And uh, by default, just because you use them. And uh, in Hystrix, you can shut it down, but it doesn't do it by itself. You have to explicitly remember to shut down the threads when your application stops. But in Archaeus, this isn't possible. So it will just fire up a new thread and it will keep running because it's designed around the principle that every new version, every new deployment will automatically mean a server restart. So if you're forgetting about, if you're missing this, then eventually you're going to end up with lots and lots of strange threads that you don't recognize that are running in the background. So. Uh, in this case, uh, fortunately, it's pretty easy to fix. Um, here, in my context listener, there is this context destroyed method. So, obviously, since I'm creating something in initialized, I should probably destroy it as well in the, this, uh, in the, this uh, other callback. So, there is this shutdown call that I can call here. Now, if I restart the server, redeploy this, it should behave a lot better. I just have to kill the instance, by the way, because uh, it couldn't shut down itself because of these running threads that I hadn't, hadn't killed. Now, it's still we're getting messages, so it's working. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to this one. Uh, this is uh, grayed out because uh, this process has already been killed, so this is only history data. I have to attach again to my new Tomcat instance. You can see this is how we're using memory. The threads are running. Pool one thread, that looks good. Now I'm going to undeploy this application, and now we have this shutdown call in place. Now it's uh, gone. Now you can see that these pool threads, they are, they are no longer active. So if I go to finished threads, here you can see here are our pool threads, fly threads, they aren't there anymore. Okay, so now we cleaned up afterwards. 
And now I can start it again, deploy it. Now it should be deployed. There it is, that's the message. Now we got the uh, pull two threads. So even uh, the name has changed, but uh, still the old ones are long gone. So now it's behaving properly. So now we're cleaning up the resources. There are no memory leaks, no thread leaks. This is the one that I already talked about. So uh, now we're going to look at some solution to, to this uh, original problem that I talked about, this heartbeat thingy. What can we do about that? So even if we're shutting down the thread pool correctly, we still have problems with our threads uh, serving uh, dead UIs. Uh, so uh, the first thing you can do is, of course, reduce uh, the heartbeat interval. That's what I did. But uh, as you saw, uh, it still might not be good enough. Uh, so the best uh, alternative in this way, and which is also a good, a good rule of thumb whenever you're dealing with threads, is to make them short-lived. So long threads are dangerous. So try to avoid them at all costs. There are some situations where you can't, but if possible, try to avoid the number of long-running threads. For example, in this case, it would have been a lot better if we had a single thread that pulled this backend, because like I said, some idiot wrote it, so we can't change it. So we have a, a polling thread that's running, uh, let's say, in application scope. And then we have some kind of public subscribe mechanism or event bus mechanism, so that this background polling thread will serve events to all the UIs that are interesting in this information. And that means that even though you have, let's say, uh, 100 UI instances that are all interesting, in this same backend information, there's still only one thread that's pulling it and notifying it, the UIs, whenever it changes. And this is a, a significant improvement already. You have exactly one thread that you will need to worry about instead of uh, an entire thread pool. And uh, it doesn't really matter that much if, uh, well, of course, it, it does matter if, if, if the, the, this polling application is, let's say, very long running, but still it's more acceptable to have one single thread pulling it even though nobody's listening than having a hundred threads pulling it even though nobody's listening. Uh, then there is another way. If you have to do polling, why not do it uh, directly from the browser instead? So there is uh, this one feature that's built into the UI, you can uh, set a poll interval. This actually forces the browser to sort of poll the UI for changes at a specific interval. And this is the sort of the old fashioned way how to do server push before we had WebSocket, before we had long polling. Then you just had to check like uh, two, two or three times a second, has something changed, has something changed, has something changed. Okay. This, of course, obviously it generates a lot of network traffic. But then again, so does this background uh, polling thing. And uh, what's more interesting about this approach is that there is actually a listener that you can add to your UI. So you will get a notification every time there is a client poll coming in. So uh, in this case, since one second, interval is enough, we could actually try that. So we're going to move to the code again. I find it. Deploy this example code. This is uh, the polling sample. We'll have a look at what the code looks like. So here we got no background threads. We got no timers. Can you see this? Okay. So here in the init method, we're adding a new poll listener. So every time we receive a poll from the client, it will invoke this listener. And then we're setting a poll interval. So every, uh, every second, 
we're going to receive an event from the client browser to the server, which is going to pull our backend. And uh, if I run this, not the thread pull sample, it's pulling sample. So we should still get the same behavior. And we can look at, at the network. As you can see, we're getting new requests once a second. So we're getting a lot more network traffic than with these previous approaches. But this uh, also has a, a neat uh, feature that makes it uh, a valid approach in certain occasions. If you have a look at, at this log again, here you can see that we're getting polls every second, if you follow these timestamps. But now if I stop the polling by clicking the browser, we get no more calls here. And this is because the polling itself is initialized from the client. <coughs> so that means as soon as I actually stop the browser, I close the browser window, the polling will stop, no more background polling. So this is uh, a usable approach in certain occasions. Now, uh, if uh, this polling operation would be a long running, it would take a long time to do it, then obviously this would be a bad approach. And also, if you have to poll often, very often, then it's also a bad approach. But still, uh, good old client browsing might be a, a good approach in certain occasions. So that's uh, good to keep in mind. Uh, I'm almost uh, done now. Uh, just some final notes. Uh, these are some general things, not necessarily related to what I just told you, but things that it's good to keep in mind when you're doing uh, asynchronous background jobs and server push with Vardin. So first of all, transactions, as I already mentioned in one of my previous talks, they are normally limited to one thread only. So uh, you might get strange side effects if you start up a new thread within a transaction and you expect that thread to participate in the same transaction. Most likely it won't work. Uh, then we got these contextual scopes. Uh, like, uh, for example, in Spring you might have different security contexts. You have this uh, uh, current user, current HTTP session, current HTTP request. Uh, these aren't necessarily always uh, moved. They aren't necessarily available in your background threads, especially if you're setting up the threads yourself. So if you're doing, like I did in this example, I'm using a Java execution service, then all the contextual data will be lost. I would have to manually transfer that into my new thread. In Java EE7, they added support for managed uh, thread pools. So there you can inject a thread pool using CDI, and then the framework will make sure that the necessary contexts are transferred to your thread. So if you're using a Java EE and CDI, you should not create your own thread pools. Instead, you should inject thread pools from the application server and use them. Uh, I'm actually not sure if Spring has something similar. Uh, then we have this current Vardin UI, current Vardin session. Uh, they are also thread local variables. They aren't also now necessarily transferred from one thread to another. Uh, but whenever you invoke UI.access, you can be sure that within that UI.access, you will always have access to the current Vardin UI and the current Vardin session. So those two are always transferred. That's good to keep in mind. And finally, uh, timeouts. Whenever you're doing a remote call within a background thread, remember to set a timeout. Because you don't want to end up in a situation where your backend goes down and your threads will lock, freeze, trying, waiting for a response from the backend server that will never come. For example, I read in a book, uh, a week ago that I think that if you're doing a new HTTP connection using the standard Java API, it doesn't have a timeout. If you do that, 
and don't explicitly set a timeout you're going to be waiting for forever for a response if the server's down. So always remember timeouts when using background threads. Make sure the thread will end eventually. So uh, main points from this talk. Use thread pools. Don't use timers. Don't create new threads. Keep your background threads short-lived. Remember the timeouts there as well. Remember to clean up after you. If you create a new thread, if you create a new thread pool, you should also kill the thread. You should shut down the thread pool. Remember the error handling. The background threads, if they fail, they will not automatically show an error message to the user. That's something that you have to make sure you do. And how you do it is based on the UI and UX design. Remember thread safety, lock the session before you touch it. If you have uh, inter-thread communication, remember to use the Java util concurrent locks or synchronized if you have really simple cases. Don't push too often. And finally, don't discard the good old browser polling without thinking through your use case, because it might be just what you need. Yes, that's all.